The front line of any battlefield always seems far away if you're not doing the fighting. But change happens fast, and one day you realise the front line is your own backyard. At this moment in history, we're fighting the final fight on the last frontiers of Earth's wild places. Poachers, warlords and the hungry kill our endangered species. Climate change is threatening conservation efforts in every corner of the globe, and greed is destroying our most fragile environments. But a thin green line of men and women, rangers, put their lives on the line to protect the most vulnerable animals and ecosystems. I'm a musician. I work in words and music and emotions, and I've always stayed connected to the land and the sacrifices of those who, like me, see the land as inseparable from ourselves. I'm an ambassador for the Thin Green Line, a foundation that supports frontline rangers across the globe. I knew I had to find out more about what it is these rangers are doing to inspire the rest of us to join their fight for conservation. It's all new, new for me. It all gets pretty real, pretty quick. You're in a car with your mates, talking shit, having fun, and then you see a herd of elephants, you know? We traveled down to Buindi, where we spent the day hanging out, trekking, and then we just hung out with a family of gorillas, a silverback and the kids, and it was incredible. But much of the food they feed on has some good water content as food yep. and as medicinal. I grew up next so to the park. My father was a conservationist and he took his time to build passion in me, the spirit of conservation, the heart of conservation. So I was like, I don't need any other job apart from working in the conservation. They like the leaves, they pick the leaves. Yeah. No any other animal that splits the plant, so you need to understand that you are following the gorillas. Yeah. So there are only two places where the mountain gorillas are living in the whole world, so that makes Gwindi a unique conservation area. My favorite part is being in nature, being so close to nature, interacting and spending my life with wild animals. Finding the mountain gorillas in their home, doing their activities, moving from place to place, feeding, grooming each other, making a lot of vocal calls. It's really amazing. I feel proud being one of the team, the big team that is making this ecosystem protected. To be there with these people who know this family of gorillas, and that's the only reason why the gorillas were seemingly you know, pretty, pretty cool with us being there, is because we were there with these guys who, who have spent years and years and years and years, you know, looking after and being there with these gorillas. We grew up being neighbors, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My dad would tell me stories about the gorillas and that had to make me build the capacity of working with them. I mean, I saw something on TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't grow up next door, yeah. but this is a lifelong dream, you know, so. Yeah. That was something I'll never forget, seeing the gorillas 
and hanging out, basically. I mean, we were no more than three metres away. If they cared if we were there, we didn't know about it, you know. They were, they were playing it pretty cool. There are few poachers who still come in the forest to do some hunting. Their target is like setting the traps. The traps may end up catching the gorillas. These are guys who are very uh, really tough. They, they undergo that training to do the poaching. They know we are there. It's a business that involves high, uh, high level people with uh, lots of money and well informed because they have connections outside country. They can even kill you or something like that because it involves a lot of money. Poachers will never end. It is something that is, is rooted in the communities. I was asked to accompany a group of indigenous rangers from Australia from the Western Desert, the Kimberleys, from Southeast Arnhem Land to Maasai country, to share knowledge and to teach and learn from each other. These are frontline rangers from Australia and East Africa, making enormous sacrifices to keep our continuous connection to the land alive and thriving. I found about the trip early on this year, and a group of guys were getting sort of volunteered to go, and I saw one of them put my hand up for it, so it was a big step, really. When I got selected, I felt happy, really happy, excited. I uh, just couldn't wait to um, come over. But when, when we started to board, I felt really nervous leaving Australia, leaving family, especially a long flight. Uh, this was just epic. And, but yeah, but here I am. <laughs> we had a phone call, then I answered the phone. And guess what? You're going to Africa. What? After one week, got my passport, got ready, and now I'm here, Africa. Family told me not, you gotta stay. No, no, I gotta go visit Africa. My coordinator asked me, oh, you gonna go to Africa? Yeah, I'll give it a go. And I get an opportunity to come, come to Africa, yeah. I'm still a little bit scared, but looking at all the animals and stuff. Yeah, no, no. I'm not going to go to the house. I'm I was a bit freaked out, really, eh? Yeah, all sorts of things were running through my head. We're going to where we're staying. National Park on this side. Hey, look at see giraffe. giraffe. We saw a bear, first bit of wildlife. We've got three groups here from our country, Australia. <laughs> Western Desert, the Matu. We've got people from the Kimberley. And we've got people, the Jarwin Rangers from the Northern Territory. They're young men who are extremely good at what they do. And they've had an opportunity to come over here and hang out with some Maasai Rangers and, and see some villages and have some adventures and uh, it's a bit of a cultural exchange. The, f the fears I had was um, animal attack, like lions or cheetahs, but, <laughs> but as soon as I got here, um, my hopes just, you know, came back to me and I just felt at home a bit, seeing the landscape, how it is, you know, with hills and rivers, so, really calmed me, calmed me down. This one is a cheap ranger. 
It's nerve wracking at first, you know, but um, you get you get more comfortable, you know, when you're around these guys with it, you know, you know, feel much safer. Really, I was amazed but when I, I see the Aboriginal people coming across Australia to, to Africa, especially Kenya, here in Amboseli. I was really impressed for, for that exchange program. Learn, learn a lot from them, um, but, but similar um, culture they got. The people, is, um, they're kind here and, you know, and they're really happy to see us. We, when we got there, was a bit nervous and they told us it's OK. Um, Nothing will allow me to use here. <laughs> we welcome you guys here. Yep. So you enjoy, don't be afraid of anything, asking any question. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of taboo in the Maasai community, usually welcome people. Yep. So a small barbecue and then uh, maybe later we have dinner. Yep. So you are welcome. How we welcome people into our country is we use these <laughs> trees here. The Gum trees, we use the uh, smaller ones, break the leaves off, and we do a smoking ceremony. In our country, we normally take them by the river. There's a, always a river there. So we have springs and a big river. So we normally get water from the river and then wet the head. So this is the poacher now. I'm the rancher. You tie my toe. Is to do this and do this. Talk and talk and talk to and talk to her till I do do this. The time I do, I'm ready to kick her and shoot. Just just Yeah. To to interact to each other, especially on the culture side, we learn a lot from them, and they will learn a lot from from us. The Aboriginal people will not see themselves as they are being the only one. And if we can't uh, protect and say, come and tell the stories, the culture will end, uh, finish. Today, we went out on a <laughs> safari trip, but you saw a heap of animals. Then we started seeing giraffes and um, zebras. Yeah, that was pretty full on. Yeah, you get really excited when you start seeing a lot of animals around. One of the older elephants had a really long tusk, which was really good to see, and they haven't seen that elephant since a year. And then we came and we, we saw them, and then everybody was just all like crazy about it, and, you know? <laughs> <laughs> My feeling was that um, we sitting there and watching it is, you know, it's really amazing, you know. Not much people get a chance to do that, and lucky enough to be one of those guys. I was excited and nervous at the same time, so yeah, bit of um, experience, different experience for us. I knew that they had different animals, and the scenery is amazing. Never seen the animal before. This was amazing. Took a lot of photo and <laughs> just got to take it back home and show it to my kids. Oh, so happy, you know? Young or now, all happy. Keba, Alaban, Trap, Monkey, Yabiri Jingin, Nanyang, Nabi. Different, we've seen them in the zoo and the circus, and we see it in real life here. There we go. We've been working with those Kadepa ranges in that same area in northern Uganda on the Sudan border equatorial ranger stations with metal roofs. So they'd be out there on patrol and working, then they'd come back, 
exhausted after being out for a couple of days without sleep and, you know, it'd be 55 degrees inside the place where they were meant to sleep. The modus operandi of Thin Green Line Foundation is not to come in there and say, hey, you need to do it this way. It's actually to listen. What's going to best help you do the job better? Then, with that information, make a decision. You got $5,000, 500 mosquito nets for rangers. Means they don't get malaria eight times a year. So this is an example of what we're talking about. In this tin, and then we that do the fashion up, up so that because during a hot day, yeah. you can't rest inside. No, no, and now the guy cannot even open the window, so the smoke keeps rotating. Yeah, so the floor is good, but the challenge is the roof because it leaks. Mm. So for ten thousand dollars, we repaired twenty banders. Those ranges in those banders said, "In the day, I can sleep." I don't have to worry anymore. Uh, I think it brings the temperature down inside by like 15, 20 degrees, which is huge. Uh, at first when I entered this house, actually it was like this. The floor itself is very rough. I'm very happy now. I'm enjoying now the good house. And you can see the floor. Everybody has to be lucky. That's good. We'll try. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Good one. Yeah. Thanks. We need to make the rangers comfortable, respected, equipped, trained to do that work. When they're living amongst elephants, lions, they need a metal door that locks, not just a curtain. They need to know that after 23 days on patrol in the national park, they've got somewhere to come and rest. If you want to protect wildlife, you need to look after the rangers. And if you don't look after the rangers, there's no protection of the wildlife. One thing that really got me was, was being at Kidepo and seeing Sean compensating a widow who had lost her husband, which meant her children could stay in school and it meant that, you know, she, she was going to be OK. I met her earlier this year. We set up the account to give her funds, but for some reason the bank account didn't work. But we had to give her the money so that her kid could go to school, so that she could set up a small business, so that she could sustain herself. It, it hit me a lot to see that. You know, to be able to witness something so powerful and out of such sadness for this person, I can't imagine how much it meant to this woman. This is critical support that keeps her kids in school, that puts a roof over her head and says, we, as rangers and people that support rangers around the world, respect you and your family. We will not leave you alone. We will not let your family go to poverty because your husband or your sister or your mother or your father was killed in the line of duty. That's the message. You matter. So every time we give some money over to a widow or a family, it's super important, not just for that family, but for the rangers watching to say, you know, the world respects us. You know, these are young people. And, you know, young people with families, leaving wives or husbands or children because they care about the environment and they care about conservation. Nobody knows my love. Nobody knows my love for you. This love could not be true. Nobody knows my love. Nobody knows my wasted day. Nobody knows my sin filled nights. No, they'll never know how hard I fight. Nobody knows my love. We had a celebration, sitting around the fire, and they sang us a bunch of songs, and I had a guitar, and I, I sang a few songs, and we just had a good laugh. It was great. 
the night in Kadapo yeah. is what the Ranger family is all about. And not just the Ranger family, but those who support us. yesterday funds to raise our uh, accommodation standards here to a decent level that you can be happy. I'm always very humbled to spend time with you because you're the real people on the front line. You deserve much more than what we can give. Can I just say this is a um, this is a big moment for me, this is a very special moment for me to play this song for you and this is as special as anything I've ever done in my life. <laughs> This is about where I grew up, all right. in Melbourne. I walked in here after 30 miles, I swaggered in with a southern style. Those rangers are passionate, they give everything and all we have to do is sit around a fire together and talk and, and give them some encouragement and then bring some funding. And that's enough to, to make them feel respected. I sung in tune and I danced all night. I looked at you as the only one. I didn't know that it had come undone. My heart was full because I felt that camaraderie of rangers that I know so well. <laughs> And I was really proud to share that with some friends and share that with Dan. And when you feel that, that camaraderie and that spirit and that de passion to defend wildlife, that passion of being a ranger, it just justifies everything I do. <laughs> Looking through a ranger's eyes, you see the community is the lifeblood of the fight to protect wilderness and wildlife. Sometimes it's about protecting the protectors, like supporting ranger families, or the widows we met, or just providing the basics. A roof, boots, mosquito nets, and sometimes it's about reaching out and educating, making sure that as neighbours, family and community, we share common goals and know that there is no future unless we protect the land that's always sustained us. We spent a little over a week in the Rift Valley between four different national parks and spent time at two of them out on outstations with rangers and spoke to them and heard you know, what they do day to day. You know, these people don't see their families for a long time. And they're out there and they, you know, they're doing a, an incredible job, a very important job and an extremely dangerous job. I am the manager for Predator Consolation Fund. Yeah. The main focus of uh, the Predator Consolation Fund is to compensate for livestock uh, killed by predators. We have had some quite of uh, challenges, but because of the good relation we have with the community, uh, the project has been successful up to date. Pondo kajanga ya, ranger kajanga. Rival kulub, warga mutja nampa. Tribune, warga marin paya, ranger kaja. We went out on a patrol and we went out to the savannah and we saw a lot of water holes where they, the community dig to water their livestock. A lot of their traditions go against a lot of what the Thin Green Line and, you know, the rangers are trying to do. A lot of baby elephants, they fall inside these water holes and uh, they get stuck. Some of them die. 
with community members, especially Maasai, to get them to agree to abandon this kind of practice, you have to really convince them. But at least we are getting there. We normally encourage foot patrols because with foot patrols you can see footprints of people who are not supposed to be there, probably they might be poachers. And at least you collect more information because you interact a lot with the, the local communities. The rangers do a 20 kilometre patrol each day. Or maybe a couple of those each day and they don't have any water on that patrol. <laughs> They travel for like miles and miles and they're out here for about a, a month or maybe two for not seeing their family, you know. helping one a um, couple of cows to get back up on their feet. We don't normally do that back home. Like helping a livestock cow. They chuck the cow in the back of the car and took it back to the village and saw heaps of people come out and the livestock's mean serious to them and the range is helping out. Back home you don't get that. Back home, you know, the meat just go home, that's it. <laughs> We are working in uh, community land. We have to work with them closely. We have to attend uh, to all the problems they have. Animals normally destroy uh, property or maybe injure humans in this area. And it's good if there is a good uh, relation between us and them. If you work with the local community of the village, in the end, like, when you help them, they'll come back and help you. So. That's better communicating with the communities and the ranges like that. And also we need them uh, in our anti-poaching operations because they know everybody in their villages. So if they see something which is not correct, they tell there is a person who has come here. And at least we have gone to arrest a lot of people who want to poach or maybe have an intention to poach in the area. I was feeling pretty homesick that day. And then that happened. And just seeing those people and the heaps of kids around and, you know, just seeing this Maasai village. And then I was ready again, you know, for another few weeks. You know, I was. It was, uh, it was pretty special. So what you are seeing is a, an assortment of poaching implements which are used by poachers around this national park. We have the wire snares, we have the wheel traps, we have the spears. This is the, the, the what we call the that round trap which the doctor was talking so about. So the rangers go on patrol and pull uh, all these out. Pull all these. And, and these are the, the wire snares. Those are the snares. If the rangers were not picking them, these are thousands of animals which would have been caught in these snares. They look vicious, if, these if ones. If you yeah. look at some of these traps, have hooves of animals cut. We have also had instances where poachers themselves are also caught in these traps yeah, they catch and, and, and their friends abandon them in the bush really? so the rangers again carry them and bring them here for treatment <laughs> the target pig meat the target the hippo 
the target the buffalo, but we also had incidences where people were targeting elephants for ivory. You took it out of an elephant? It was hit from the back. In the back, yeah. I'm a spokesperson for the animals because for them they don't talk. Somebody must speak for them. It is really very important for us to be connected internationally because it highlights the plight of the rangers. Also puts us on the map and makes people to appreciate what we do. And you really see how they look like. You really know that these people have put their life at the forefront of conservation. I have grown within this park. I know when I see a new person in the area, uh, I have to report either that one should be a poacher along the channel here. It's a possible death sentence, you know, you know being a ranger here. There's big money in poaching, and they won't think twice about killing someone. My rangers were attacked about two weeks ago. Such an exposure, international exposure, it makes you really know what we go through on a day-to-day basis. We are brothers, we are sisters, we chat, we share the views. How should we conserve? Our group went up into the Chulu Hills. Beautiful country up there. But what they do up there is they look after the black rhino. They've got seven black rhino up there, seven. Most of the people targeting our rhinos here are the guys from Somalia. I think this, uh, this rhino poaching, elephant poaching is funding a lot of terrorism. The cringes are losing their lives almost every day in the country because of that. Yeah, because these guys, they have like, you know, do or die, we have to get this animal. A range has to give out all his life, uh, protecting critically endangered species here. 95% of our rangers uh, purely regional Maasai. They used to be warriors. Warrior means uh, you are like traditional kind of traditional hunters. They've been with wildlife since they are kids. The poachers are heavily equipped. They have got like really good weapons. So it's, it's not an easy job to do. I'm doing a foot patrol with our friends from Australia, Rangers, trying to track down some rhinos that we have here. Work wise, you just get a better view on how hard the other rangers have it. I noticed they don't really use much technology like how we do, but they they achieve a lot yeah, even though they don't use much. See, it's much fresh. Mm. See from last night, maybe like yeah, be three in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, seven, eight years old. So how long is footprint? Maybe from last night, maybe. It's much fresh. You can see. Yeah. Who is tracking? Who's okay. the best tracker? Who's the champion? Just the tracker here. Okay. The boys <laughs> were tracking them. For a while, they said, show us your tracking skills, and they were, they were tracking this rhino, you know. They knew what they were doing. A lot of the things obviously kind of sync up and line up, living on the land and knowing what to look for or listen for. You know, these guys bringing their skills that they learnt back home and being able to apply them in a completely different part of the world. Yes, different. Yeah. Faru. Guys, I think we'll uh, have to leave her. She must have gone pretty far, yeah. right now. So we just go back and try see if she went through the camera trap. It's very rare to see them, and we didn't see one, but they've got camera traps set up with motion detected, and they take a photo. Uh, Bravo Lima, Before 
Um, you guys came down here. I was thinking big country with big buildings, kind of New York City maybe, like that. Um, but since I've met some native or aboriginal people from Australia, it's more kind of Kenya. Yeah, the, the culture on is just almost similar to ours. What we do back at home is this, we just share the, we share all our culture all together, which is uh, really great to see around here. Bring these people together, it will kind of motivate each and every person working at the conservation department. I'm not alone in this work. There's somebody in Australia, somebody at the States, somebody at the United Kingdom, somebody in West Africa that, you know, is doing the same thing I'm doing. He's passing the hardship I'm passing through. Seeing people come all the way from the other side of the world to come here and show their support and say, we're here with you. They realise that there are people everywhere a part of this family, you know, the Ranger family. These young Indigenous Rangers came here with a really good view of their own country. But now they're leaving with this extended view of the worldwide Ranger family. And they're proud. I asked them, do you know why you're able to go on foot patrol? Do you know why you've had all these experiences? And they said, yeah, we're Rangers. The guys in the, in the matching soccer shirts, they were a band and they were selling CDs and they had these beautiful old traditional instruments and it was just, I mean, they just started and just kicked in and anyone who is a fan of music, I mean, you know when it hits you. And they're singing Welcome to Merchantson, you're welcome, and it just it, it hit me. I bought all their CDs, they had two for sale, and so far I they don't work. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a good clean when I get home. But if they don't, they don't. It was still an amazing experience. We caught up with some female rangers, which was an amazing thing to see, and met this incredible woman who was training them. She was amazing. I'm Lily. Hi, Lily. Very nice to you meet too. you. What I'm doing with them is leadership training. Great. Yeah, and it is a personal passion. We yeah. try and promote women in leadership. Ladies, we have some visitors. From day one. What has been my emphasis? Network, network, network. The International Ranger Federation networks rangers from across the world. And I'm very honoured to speak to you as rangers and people working in conservation. This is Dan. Dan is not a ranger. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very talented musician. And Dan will be performing a concert on the Savannah in Kenya. And so he's coming around meeting rangers and seeing the work we're doing. So he can also have a voice to other people that aren't rangers or haven't thought of rangers. It's an honour to be here and see your work. And um, it's a great experience and opportunity for me. It's a great honour. I really appreciate it. And so thank you very much for having us. Thanks. Thank you. With whatever we are doing here, you know, they will have more encouragement and more inspiration to achieve those big dreams. I know the road for you as female people working in conservation is more difficult, but I want you to know that you have friends around the world. And we're here with you. 
and uh, we'll do whatever we can. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Music is a lot of things, but at the heart of it, it's just a way of communicating. And to see the rangers listening, talking, sharing ways of protecting the land is humbling. It doesn't take long to find the things we share in common. Then we learn from the differences. And here you had these young sisters, brothers and old fellows, all with their hearts and eyes open, with the single purpose of conservation guiding them. When they used to dance like this, that's the way to choose the, the boyfriend. When the boys are dancing here and the girls dancing on the other side. This <laughs> We saw Wookie meet the elders of the Maasai. And they were translating between three or four different languages. 
Matu mob had some gifts for the Maasai elders, and the Maasai elders no, had a gift for the elder from the Western Desert. No. So this this one is you can use as a whole man. So you walk like this one. Yeah, he can support you. Here we go. Chotin ban laju. Then I know. Punda junga yung. Punda juna yung. Tima da jing. So Muki saying similar when they when their boys are becoming men through yeah. initiation, they try to kill things with this yeah. as well. They are talking about how they keep their cultures really strong and, and obviously different ways of doing it, but still essentially the same thing. One of the elders had said something about making sure they keep the young, the young fellas in line. It was translated from Matu into English, into Swahili, into Maasai, and then they all laughed. <laughs> <laughs> It's been exciting looking at all the animals um, coming here. I tell my family I learned different idea with the metal rangers. When I go back, it's going to be a good memory. I have no like pleasure to be one of the lady rangers who's around this yeah, place. We have to like take pictures uh, for evidence and take it to the police. We got some um, women rangers too. Yeah. Yeah. That's got, nice. We've got one group up in the Lost Kimberley. We cannot allow anybody to go inside this bunker with any food. Maybe yeah. we can have a chance to go to Australia yeah, or somewhere good. else, you know. Really good, yeah, sure. Here to come Australia and take you and show you what around there. I know. In our final days with the Rangers, we visited a memorial to the fallen. We stood and listened to the names of the many killed. How do you make sense of the fact that in the last 10 years, Around a thousand rangers have been killed trying to protect the most beautiful and wildest places. That these men and women do it with so little, struggling for support just to have boots to patrol in or a roof over their heads. It makes me question who we've become. If we can't protect these undamaged corners of the world and protect their protectors, who are we? And if we don't stand alongside these rangers, these protectors, on the front lines of conservation, where will we end up?
Hi, my name is Imran, and I would like to say thank you to the Messiah and all the Rangers here. Um, it was a really good experience coming out to your country. From behalf of all the Rangers here we have, this, this is the symbol of our flag back in Australia. The black represents the people. The yellow circle represents the sun, and the red represents the land. Um, mm. Next time we come back, we might bring a kangaroo back. <laughs> the call of the spirit lives in the caves and the hillside. So this is a small gift for you guys. Thank you so much. Nice. It's a That's a big part of our um, growing up. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I love music, you yeah. know. It's uh, throughout my life, you yeah, know, music's just been a, a rock for me. It makes me feel very proud to be a part of the Line yeah. and to help in any way that I can. I'm here to help raise awareness and, you know, shine a bit of a light about the Thin Green Line and this project, and also to play a gig on the Savannah, and it was just the most beautiful setting in the Massa over there. And I think I played five or six songs, and then, um, you know, so about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then I asked them, do you know a song? And they said, yeah. And so then that was it for about three hours. <laughs> and we danced, they were singing, and I mean, it was incredible. I mean, I'm just glad that I went on first because I <laughs> didn't want to follow that. <laughs> That party was amazing. Seeing dance all can play some Christian dance. Amazing. They welcomed us like family. 
Masai and the Australian families. They're good people and the same, we do the same culture but different, different way. Oh, when I go back home here, sit down under the fire and watch the stars and tell them yarn so about Africa. It's like a family to me, all these rangers. It's like a family to me. Right? Yes. Ingolum, Ranger, Nalaju, Canyon and Banga, Ingolum. Or a Laju Nagwango, and Nayon Gunuyat, Yumunogunijanu. Oh,